Hey, hello and welcome. It is Adafruit's show and tell, the uh, the greatest, biggest recurring show and tell of electronics and hobby project things, coding, uh, all kinds of crafting right here on your internet, uh, yours and mine's internet. Uh, I'm John Park and I'm filling in this evening for Lamore and Phil because they are off doing uh, saving New York City kinds of things. Uh, they're on a council for uh, small business associations uh, dealing with the the various crises going on. Uh, and so uh, they asked me if I could fill in. So we've been practicing for a few weeks now and a few of us have been uh, running some show and tell. So hopefully this will go smoothly. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to start bringing in people who have projects to show. Uh, we'll go for an hour or so if we have enough people to fill that time. So uh, by, by my clock, that's uh, five o'clock Pacific time. Uh, it'll be eight o'clock Eastern time. So if you want to join us, go on over to the Discord chat, or you can check out the Adafruit blog where we've listed a link for coming on in. Uh, if you don't get in, keep trying, because as people go and finish, they will leave the uh, stream yard and that'll allow a new person to come on in. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is check in with our friend, Dan Shapiro of Glowforge. Hey, hey. hello, Dan. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Very glad to have you. It's nice to see you. Hope uh, you're holding up well and safe and sane. Yeah, we uh, we went into uh, quarantine a little earlier in Seattle than everybody else. So hold up at home. Uh, I have uh, twins who are 11. So it was one night of let's go home and figure out how to homeschool our kids. Oh, yeah. And uh, and it's been, you know, an adventure ever since. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, lots of time to play on the toys we've got at home. So that's been fun. True. Yeah. So I uh, I know at least one thing you guys have been up to is there's a design floating around for some uh, ear savers for masks. Yes. Lowforge uh, has shared with the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I will. Uh, I'll give you the, the quick backstory, which was uh, when this broke out, a bunch of people started saying, hey, are we going to um, fabricate PPE? Are we be using our 3D printers and our lasers and everything else? Because um, Glowforge, at Glowforge, we make the Glowforge 3D laser printer. It's a 40 or 45 watt laser cutter engraver um, that's really easy to use and starts at $2,500 and, um, and is uh, designed to, to be used at home. And uh, I, uh, in my infinite wisdom said, there is no way in hell hospitals are gonna be accepting medical equipment that people made in their garage. And turned that out to be wrong. That was thought originally, right? <laughs> that, that was uh, hopeful That's and it turned out incorrect thought. Um, <laughs> I, uh, hopeful that it wasn't gonna get this bad, but now it's that bad. Um, I wound up uh, through one thing led to another and I connected with Dr. Culpepper at MIT who used his, the Glowforge in his garage to prototype uh, a face shield that pulled down over the face and and protected the mask and the face and everything else. And I said, "Can we go? Uh, can we go into full production? Can we share this with all of our our uh, our uh, our customers so that they can make these?" And he said, "You know, uh, we think the best way to do these is by die stamping. So we use the Glowforge prototype, but we're going to make millions of these a day, and they're really sensitive, and we don't want to have ones that aren't correctly produced." Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I would go check into. Uh, this problem that people who are wearing masks all day wind up with bruises behind their ears. And uh, the PPE is often missized, so they're using extra small masks mm -hmm. for people who can't or vice versa. Um, it turns out that it's, it's a problem that disproportionately affects uh, women and people with smaller face sizes because they're the ones more likely to get PPE that doesn't fit. And he said, it, you know, these ear savers that are starting to float around are incredibly valuable, but people are going to need hundreds of thousands of them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a place where you can get in there and, and nobody's tackling that problem. So we had uh, one of our uh, mechanical engineers came up with this design that tessellates perfectly. So, uh, you know, they all, they, they all interlock. And we started out what we what we called the, the 2 million essential ears initiative, which was let's go get a million of these printed and get them on two million, uh, 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 on a million people's uh, masks. And it's been wild. So, so far we've had uh, over half a million printed. We're very close to getting a wow. million, but demand has gone through the roof. And I think part of this was we're looking at medical staff who need these, but we're also looking at delivery drivers. We're looking mm -hmm. at the grocers who are bringing us our food. And we're looking at the people who are uh, delivery drivers, anybody who's wearing a mask to keep us safe and saying, we're going to supply all of them. And so it's turned into two pieces. Uh, one is that anybody who has a laser that can make these, and it doesn't need to be a Glowforge, can go to glowforge.com, sign up, and uh, and get 
paired with somebody in their community to go print these and deliver them. Then we started having hospitals and grocery chains ask for 5,000 or 10,000 at a go. And some of those larger requests are adding up to 10 million ear savers. Wow. So we decided we we're going to go take a whole different tax. We um, have taken uh, part of our factory that's producing Glowforge units and are running ear savers uh, mm -hmm. on uh, a dozen Glowforge machines there. And when that started to tap out, we uh, went and spent, um, uh, gosh, well, the PO was over $100,000. And that was tools, plastic, labor, and everything else to start making millions of injection molded plastic ear savers. Because oh, wow. while that's not really what we do, it's something we can do to help. Not too so, far off from how you were yeah. working already, yeah. Yep, and so we're going to be uh, giving away millions of these. Uh, we're 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 already prepped to do ten million, and the number may go significantly beyond that. But and you said that you had set up a uh, page on your site where people could figure out how to get paired up between someone who owns a laser cutter and someone who's in need. So you guys are handling some of that matchmaking. Exactly. So if you go to glowforge.com, there's a link right at the top and you can either say, I'm going to sign up to help fabricate, or I'm going to sign up to get these for me or for people in my community. And if you can help fabricate, please do, because we need people uh, in every local area to, you know, to deliver three of these to, uh, you know, to a dentist's office adds real value and, and, and help. And that's something that we can't do as efficiently. <clears throat> And then at the same time, if you know people who are on the front lines, people who are working with medical staff, working with grocers, working with delivery drivers, send them there. It is really easy. They fill out a form and then we'll put them in the queue to either be matched locally or get have them shipped uh, centrally. So uh, it's crazy to be able to do this like decentralized manufacturing at scale and make a difference so quickly. Spinning up uh, half a million of something in well under a month. I think it took like uh, two weeks to get to half yeah, a million. It, also the journey of figuring out how you were going to focus on maybe making a million or two to now 10 million and, and uh, getting into injection molding of plastic. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yep. And, uh, and I mean, my daughter upstairs, you probably can't hear the here in the background, but she's cranking out ear savers. There's these, uh, it looks like mirepoix. Looks like, <laughs> like you got your celery and your onion and your your carrot. Uh, this is 200 that are going to a hospital um, in South Seattle. And she just went to the site. She was like, Dad, can I do it? I'm like, absolutely. So she went to the site, submitted the, um, uh, the, the her information, got paired up with a registered nurse, um, delivered 100. And she's like, if you can do 300, then we can use 300. And so now she's fabricating for the entire entire chain. Oh, that's fantastic. That makes a real difference. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, and, and, I, and I imagine you and some of your staff are, are staying safe, but going in to set this up and, and keep your, uh, your factory rolling with the PPE equipment. So thank you. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. I have one other link to share, which is yeah. totally unrelated. No but uh, if you have kids at home and they yeah. are bored and they, they are, are looking for something to do, <laughs> we had this problem. And um, my brother is the host of uh, All Things Considered on NPR. Uh -huh. And uh, and I hit him up and I was like, how about if you teach current events to my kids? And he's like, that would be a blast. How about if we record it and put it online? Oh, cool. And that's kind of scaled up. So if you go to shapiroschool.org, you'll uh -huh. find a YouTube channel, which has oh. current events for my brother. But we also just had, uh, it's about to go up. We've got a Q&A with um, uh, Chell Lindgren, who's a NASA astronaut. We have a lecture, an hour long lecture. This is targeted fifth graders about space archaeology from Dr. Parchek, who finds Egyptian pyramids from or, uh, ruins, uh, tombs from space, and then leads groups of a hundred, uh, expeditions of a hundred people to go excavate them. So she is one of those people who is first in the door wow. in, in Egyptian tombs. We've got music appreciation from a Grammy Award nominated opera singer. So shapiroschool.org if you want something cool. fun to do with yeah. your kids. Oh, that's so great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's My wonderful. Pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. We appreciate uh, all you guys are doing. And we'll talk to you again sometime soon, I hope. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. All right. Very cool stuff. I can't wait to check out that site. Uh, in the meantime, let's bring on our friend Kevin from DigiKey. Hey, Kevin. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. How's things? Things are great. You know, just Kevin from DigiKey here. Uh, we are still cranking out all your electronic orders. We are running full bore, and it's it's been a journey. How has the uh, 
Adafruit button changed things for for you guys? I know the scales are a little bit different, but are you are you finding that uh, stuff you used to sell and work with Adafruit on is coming in through you guys now? Yeah, we are definitely seeing a big difference. We are, there's a lot of a, a lot of new customers and a lot of new sales, and it's been great. We've been getting you know shipments in from Adafruit to be able to fulfill a lot of these orders. So it's been very well received inside the building and outside That's of the great. building. So we appreciate all the Adafruit customers out there. It's been it's been good. Fantastic. And, you know, we are pretty lucky uh, in northern Minnesota. We are quite remote. So we, we don't have a lot of cases up here, which actually I think we only have one in our county. Mm -hmm. But DigiKey is treating it as if we have a lot. So we're keeping our PDC people working in the building and everybody else is at home just to make sure we can still pump out those, you know, 20, 22,000 boxes a day. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, so I do have one thing I want to share really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, we work with a company called Kitronic and I know they've been in talks with Adafruit and they sent me a, a, a new buggy that they're going to be uh, creating and having part of inventory very soon. And I was able to, uh, to get my hands on one of them. So this is it. You know, it, it takes the micro bit, which we all know, we all know and love the micro bit program of block code, but Adafruit has this amazing board called the Clue. So I spent some time trying to work with it and, and get it to work, and we have it working really well. Uh, in just a second here, you'll see the little Katronic logo, and right now it's seeing... It's really loud, so I didn't want to talk as I was sharing it, but I have just set up a quick ultrasonic sensor. Once it sees something, it backs up and it's going to try and roam around a room. It was just kind of a, a prototype design. But what I love about this stuff is a lot of these Kitronic boards that they have that are made for the micro bit will also work with the Clue. And then you can program with CircuitPython and your options are endless, which is amazing. This new little guy has line following on it. It has some RGB LEDs to be able to change the color. Uh, oh, servo connections also available. And what I really love about Kitronics products is they not only have the great hardware, they have the classes and curriculum to back them up and be able to use these in bigger areas such as schools and STEM education. And, you know, for those kids at home uh, that, like Dan just said, bored at home, let's have them do something. And between the micro bit and some of these Adafruit products, my kids have been staying quite busy and they're learning a lot. Yeah, that's really, so it's really, cool. really great. So are you coding in uh, Circuit Python when you're using the Clue with those right now? I am, and I'm pretty new to Circuit Python. I've been playing with it for the last year, and the brilliant thing behind this is I'm not excellent at it, but your Discord channel, there's people on there that are answering questions immediately. It's really incredible to have that kind of support. That's great. Yeah. No, I've been excited about. Uh, Going and going back and finding some of the peripherals for Microbit that I have and using them along with the uh, the Clue board because they're they're pin compatible and so there's this you know when when Clue came out already being a you know fitting into a standard of that edge connector pin out uh, made it suddenly have way more peripherals than a, than a brand new board would normally have which has been great yeah it, it is really great and having the screen on there I'm still working on it I want to be able to as it's changing the direction change the image on the screen and just put a lot of different cool things into it. Oh, that's great. And, you know, like you said, the Clue is so adaptable to Microbit. You know, we definitely don't want to knock down the Microbit because that still is an amazing product. Yep. But it's just nice to have more opportunities. Yep, yep. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for showing that. That's really cool. And I'm glad you've uh, you've been having fun starting to uh, dive into CircuitPython. And uh, especially glad that you found support on Discord because uh, it's, it is a great place. And I find myself there a lot looking for answers. So. Yeah, it, it is really great. The community out there is awesome. And, you know, before we take off, I just want to, again, say thank you to everybody. DigiKey is really appreciative of all of you. And it's a, a great community to be a part of. So Fantastic. Well, we appreciate you, too. And uh, stay safe and keep up the great work shipping all that stuff out to people. <laughs> everyone everyone oh, wants will. their stuff. We will. Thanks, Thanks a, lot. a lot. Take care. See you, Kevin. All right. Well, let's see who have we got next. Let's uh, bring on Aaron, who has some uh, blinky, beautiful stuff going on here in the background. It seems. Hey, Aaron. Hi. Um. So I'm I'm showing off my latest project uh, slash obsession, 
Um, I've been I've been making these little cellophane crystals. They're paper crafted crystals. I designed them in Fusion 360 and then used a slicer to slice them out into flat little panels, which I can then fold and put together. And I tell you, I'm stuck inside because we're all stuck inside. Um, I'm like normally my 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 main thing is I do events. I go out and I entertain people and. Um, it's been really challenging. It's like it's like my whole soul has been, you know, ripped out and stomped on, and it's gone. Uh, you know, my whole purpose in living is is <laughs> is on hold this year, and a lot of performers are too. Um, and I've just been finding that, like, just folding these little crystals has been making me really happy. Um, I'm making it. I'm going to put them up on my Etsy. I want to share this. I'm sending them to all my friends because it's just so much fun. But in the meantime, I have been uh, just making, as you can see, a zillion of them. I've put, um, I have a, I'm going to share my screen here and uh, see if I can, I have a little video with a close up. If you want to show that. Um, I've just been uh, just gluing them all into this acrylic sheet and the the back behind has just got a, a NeoPixel strip with a circuit playground, and right now it's just running a rainbow animation. But um, just the variation and the texture and the this it's incredible. I'm gonna uh, end up making it into a crystal cave. I think I'm gonna make myself a little mermaid cave that I can sit inside. Awesome. I'm also thinking about uh, I don't know if uh, if if I get the gumption to upsource this and to get people to help me fold these things, like making a whole geodesic dome out of it that I could bring oh, wow. to events and stuff like that. You could sit inside and just be surrounded by these crystals on all sides. Would be really, really cool. So uh, that is kind of what I've been doing with all my time. So I yeah. love it. Yeah, it seems like it's it's such a meditative thing to have uh, a repetitive task like that that you have to use, you know, your use your hands on and probably keeps you uh, focused enough that you're not thinking about uh, the outside world and your missed gigs and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, wow, uh, it's really beautiful. And I think we saw some projects where you were showing uh, some NeoPixels uh, inserted in individual ones, but this is, you're you're putting this on like a clear backing so you can just. Yeah, so uh, if you show my, show my main screen again right now, it's just, it's on, uh, they're just hot glued onto a piece of, it's a quarter inch acrylic, which I put, um, I sanded it so that it's a little more diffused and then uh, put some, actually some uh, one-way mirror spray paint on top of it to make it a little bit reflective as well. And now I've got the NeoPixels behind it and they're facing this way and reflecting off of another white uh, sheet that I just have back here. So you can kind of see that reflection um, really diffuses them nicely. So it's been a lot of fun to try and play with uh, seeing how I can get, you know, just one NeoPixel strip to cut, to light up the whole entire thing instead of that having- That is such each a cool trick to bounce the light off of something further back to get some some more distance on your diffusion. I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's working yeah. really well. Obviously, it's, it's, getting, it's getting there. You can oh, see yeah. them a little bit through, but it does just kind of look like occlusions in the crystal. So I yeah. think I'm, I'm happy with this, so. So cool. I'm really glad you found this. Just in time. This was the right moment for you to find <laughs> this uh, this new hobby. I definitely needed it. So yeah. good. Well, I think by the time so we come out of quarantine, my whole house is just going to be crystal. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I can picture it. Grotto is just the beginning. That's right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. And, uh, and keep on making those. We can't wait to see the uh, collection grow. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up. Uh, we have got Dan Halbert. Hello, Hello. Dan. Hey, uh, how are you? Can you hear me? Good. Yes, okay. very well. Thank you. So uh, I've been working yet more on uh, Bluetooth lower energy for Circuit Python, and we now are, they've done something called Adafruit Services, which is that we define a Bluetooth service. Uh, for each kind of sensor that you might have, like a temperature sensor, humidity sensor, and also some other stuff like new pixel control and listening to the microphone and stuff like that. And we have Arduino versions of these um, uh, our Adafruit services, but I've now developed that for um, CircuitPython, just got that working in the last few days. So let me switch cameras here. There we go. And so I've got three boards here that, that are talking, three Adafruit boards that talk Bluetooth, Circuit Playground, Bluefruit, um, the Clue, which you've already talked about, and the Sense board, which is kind of has a whole bunch of sensors on it, 
kind of like the clue without the screen. Um, same sensors like humidity sensor, accelerometer, and stuff like that. And we have this app that we use for demos called uh, Blue Fruit Playground. So uh, these boards are all advertising themselves as being available, and I'll choose one of them. And now uh, I'm connected to the um, uh, to the circuit playground here, and I can find out things like I can find out how much light there is. So you can see, unfortunately, it's kind of too bright. Let me do this a little higher so it doesn't get so washed out. But um, I can also control do things like control the new pixels, change the pattern that's happening here. And I can make it play music. And I can, uh, there's a kind of a virtual um, puppet that I can move around here. I can find out the orientation of the board the same way here. And I can do that for any of these boards. So you can use this app, but also you'll be able to write circuit playground program or circuit Python programs that talk to these boards in the same way. So you can have one board listening to another, like one board taking measurements and the other board doing something with those measurements. And besides this app, we also have something called um, the web Bluetooth dashboard. Let me turn this so you can see it which is a, a web-based thing. I'm writing this on an Android tablet. I was surprised that it worked. Let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. So I'll try talking to the sense board. And now it's doing the same kind of thing. It's monitoring a whole bunch of these Adafruit services all at once, the temperature, the light, and so forth. There's something wrong with the accelerometer. We'll have to fix that. But you can set up a dashboard and monitor a whole bunch of sensors at once. And you can customize this. It's not just a canned program on either end. So that's what we've got. You'll, you'll see some projects and some guides about this in the near future. That's really cool. Uh, OK. Does the web dashboard allow you to connect to multiple devices simultaneously? I don't think so. But that's a, that would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, multiple boards, you're saying. Right, uh, but you can have, of yeah. course, you have multiple sensors on one board. You could actually probably open multiple windows. It probably depends on how the Bluetooth support uh -huh. works in the browser. So we're using some native support that Chrome provides in the browser mm -hmm. for Bluetooth. Oh, that's really cool. All right, I'll switch back cameras here. All right. And one question I had, I know we, we had talked about this a while ago, and I can't remember where it landed, but there was some talk about things like having native code on the microcontroller and sending uh, things like NeoPixel pattern animations just by triggering stuff that lived on the microcontroller versus streaming uh, data on over. Does it work one way or the other right now? You can, we don't have a service for that, but we could invent one really easily. Like you could say like, oh, do this right now, this the NeoPixel service that we have now is like you're sending the raw data. So mm -hmm. the host computer decides what the pattern is. But okay. there's no reason why we couldn't add stuff to that that says do, do this kind of animation or that kind of animation. That's cool that it's, it's working. It's all out really first. flexible. And the code to define each of these services is only like 15 lines of code or something like that. So really straightforward to do. Cool. Like Good. the whole, the whole, the whole thing that's generating all the data that's going to the dashboard or to the app is um, it's only like a page of code or so. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm looking forward to playing with it. Thanks for showing those off, Dan. You're welcome. We'll see you. Bye bye. All right. Uh, let's see who we got next. Let's uh, bring on Noah and Pedro. I see you guys have a, uh, a hey. second screen there. Should I add that to a second camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it. Oh, you got it. Fantastic. Yeah. You have the, You have the con. Hey, we're still here. We haven't left yet. <laughs> uh, so this week's project is a also a BLE project. It's using the Feather Sense and the app. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> it's snoring at us. Um, so it's uh, hissing. <laughs> it it it's uh, it's paired to my device, my iOS device, and it lets me know when I get a notification. Um, where did that notification go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it went. Uh, let me send a new one. Uh, so you pair it to your iOS device and um, it will <laughs> trigger the, the mini vibration motor and it uses the haptic motor driver so you can choose different effects and things. 
Um, so the 3D printed case is is a snap fit case, of course. Um, we, we're using the onboard NeoPixel to let us know uh, when the notification has has come. And I got one from Pedro. It says Buzz. How uh, how appropriate. So I'll clear it out <laughs> when you clear it out. <laughs> when you clear it out, I got another one. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting bombarded just with messages right now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's a really cool example of using the um, the BLE uh, libraries and the Apple Notification Center library, which is fairly new. Um, so check it out. Um, shout out to Liz who uh, put together the demo code for this one. It also has some other features like uh, as a as a you can use it like as a mindfulness timer. So if you need to get reminded to stand up or or do certain things, um, you can do that. I love also, your, it's a cool little case. <laughs> I love your case, and I love the light bar. Is that uh, just an inset ah. piece of 3D printed filament, or exactly? So it's just a little press fitted bit, and I just have some double sided tape that I stuck uh -huh. in there. Um, but you can pop it out, and uh, it's it's really good material. Um, nice that translucent, natural clear is what it's called. But yeah, it's PLA, mm -hmm. um, so it uh, it works really nice for diffusing uh, the NeoPixel. I like it better than using white PLA um, because this kind of brings out the the, pit, the the light saturation a little bit better, mm -hmm. like the colors. So uh, yeah, check it out. That's beautiful. And is that compatible with um, the teenage engineering IKEA stuff? Does it fit into that world of? Uh, it's it's heavily based on the uh, style of it, but it the doesn't... style of it, yeah. And, and some um, of their stuff is like modular, right? You can like add a fog machine to your base. Right. Yeah, yeah. and it has lots Probably. of like uh, throughput, so you can kind of connect them together oh, okay. and do different things, but. Cool. Uh, Man, I need to clear out my notifications. I got quite a few of them. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for showing that really cool project. I, I love the way that one yeah, works. Thank you for hosting. This is this Excuse is super me. fun. Right on. Thanks, guys. All right. So uh, let's see. Melissa is next. Let's bring on Melissa and see what she's got. Hello. Hello. So I have uh, this great fit one here. And it has a, an LCD attached to it. And I have been working on adding Blinka. And so if I run this little script, uh, CircuitPython script here, it'll go and print out a message on here. It says, hello, great fat one. Uh, I can't hear you, John. You may have to put yourself on there. Hey, too. there we go. I'm back in. Sorry about that. <laughs> So this is uh, which display and and uh, how have you coded oh. the great fit to? This is the uh, TFT 2.0 uh, display. It's uh, based on the ST7789, and um, it's just I added the uh, some spy support, so it's just connect. It's just talking over spy for it. Very cool. That's the most stylish looking board. I love the PCB on that thing. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for showing that. It sounds like your cat also uh, approves heartily. Uh, my cat wants to be fed. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for checking in, Melissa. I'll let you go <laughs> feed the cat. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's break the streak of Adafruit people. I'm going to bring on Sam, who has been waiting patiently over here. <laughs> Sam. Hello there. Hi. So I have um, I. I'm a Star Wars fan and like I build models and stuff. So I made this installation here. It's like, um, it's a big dia big old diorama um, with um, these ships. It's running on a trinket here. So it's got all the blinky details in the cockpit. Um, and this explosion is, uh, some high power LEDs and I uh, kind of rolled my own driver for those. And the backdrop is all 3D printed, which took, you know, like a day for each one. So a couple weeks and painted and all that. So it was a, a few months project. And uh, yeah. That is a beautiful labor of love. Oh my gosh, it looks fantastic. So. Yeah, so that's that's my dining room. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So did you um, model the ships as well, or are those kits you built uh, and then added so, your modeled wall? Yeah, so the uh, the ships are kits. Um, they're very old kits that aren't made anymore um, mm -hmm. for this scale. 
And the cockpits are actually resin 3D printed because I didn't like the cockpits that came with the kits. Um, so that's both of them. And uh, this this has, it's hard to see on here, but the, the figure here is the stock figure that I painted. The figure in the TIE Fighter, which is not going to show up on the on the webcam, but that Darth Vader was, uh, I resin printed him too. So, yeah. That is incredibly cool. I don't know about uh, the the world of Star Wars model collection, but I'm guessing this is considered a pretty impressive uh, way to display it that you've done here. Is this sort of normal in the, in the model world? I have, or? I have never seen anything like That's this. It's really great. Um, so yeah, they, they're attached with these uh, these copper pipes that are painted to kind of make them invisible. Uh, yep. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, please, if you ever want to come on again and show more of your, your models uh, or, or, or other work that you've done, that was a real pleasure to see those. Those are really uh, next level. Yeah, this is fun. Thank so, you so much, Sam. Thank you. All right, that was totally bad. And by bad, I mean good. All right, let's bring on uh, Brent. Hey, Brent. Hi, John. That model was really cool. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like something you'd seen Disney, like, on a queue into a ride. Yeah, it's a little different. Like, if I end up with a cool model or something, and then I just sort of set it somewhere. But uh, he's elevated it by coming up with a uh, much, much cooler artistic way to display it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the past few weeks, I've been working on adding uh, cellular modules to CircuitPython. It's the only transport medium we didn't have for sending data. So now we have a guide on sending data. It came out today with CircuitPython. It's like 30 lines. And if you can't access a router or you can't access BLE or you're too far from some router gateway node, every method of communication fails. There's always cellular towers. So um, it's a good fallback. And we have it working with uh, the Fona 808. And we'll soon have it working with the Fona 3G. So I have a demo of it texting my phone. So I have a SIM 808, which is a Fona 808, and then a BME 280 sensor hooked up. And then this is hooked up to an Itsy Bitsy uh, M4. And every 30 seconds, let me do face ID it'll text me the temperature, humidity, and pressure from Lafona. And I'm going to add something in it tomorrow for it to, um, so I can text Lafona for the data and it will respond with the data back. That's so you cool. can text back and forth with the modules. And I actually have a Fona 3G that I wanna add and I got it from DigiKey and I haven't ordered an Adafruit product from DigiKey before. <laughs> so they ship it to you in a DigiKey bag. If you've ordered from DigiKey, it looks like this. And then inside of the DigiKey bag is a <laughs> normal bag that you would get from Adafruit. That's so um, both of these products are actually sold out on adafruit.com, mm -hmm. but you can order them through DigiKey. Oh, that's great. So I've never done any of the cellular stuff. And it, I, I'm assuming that that is the mode where everything is essentially done as a text message. So that's you're not going into like Adafruit IO with it unless you set up something fancy on your receiving end of a cellular. So we, I, I built this module to run in a bunch of different ways. So if you want to use the, um, the data modem, so if you want to use it for cellular data, you can actually use sockets with um, mm. the phone module and connect it to MQTT, or it can send oh. HTTP requests. Mm -hmm. Or you can use the more phone e modules, so like texting or calling. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, separated in the libraries. Can it do creepy stuff like a uh, regular call and then play audio? I haven't added that, but <laughs> okay, maybe not, we but could. Maybe if you have a do. project in mind, we could. All right, <laughs> I'll think about that. That's really cool. Excellent, good. Well, thank you for doing that. I'm, I'm excited to see uh, a, a sort of modernized, updated uh, use of some of the cellular modules. That'll be fun to start playing with. Yeah, and soon we'll have um, maybe 4G in the future, uh, mm -hmm. more modern cellular technologies. These are running on uh, 3G right now? or This is a 2G, GSM, and then this is a 3G modem. Okay, got it. Great. 
Okay, thanks for sharing that. That's very cool, very exciting. And maybe you can uh, pair up with uh, Noah and Pedro and make their little box buzz a whole bunch autonomously. Well, we'll have enough notifications for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Take care. All right, uh, let's see, who do we have up next? Uh, how about Kmatch98? I see you uh, in the waiting room. Let's bring you on. Hello. Hey there, hey there. can you hear me? Very well, thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, thanks for having me on. So sure. uh, I've been watching the CircuitPython, how it's grown over the past few years, and it's really gotten more capable. Uh, and I ran across this uh, gentleman on Twitter by the name of Back7, who makes a cyber deck with these Raspberry Pi that are portable PCs. Uh, and I thought, hey, what does it take to make a CircuitPython portable computer? Basically, a lot simpler, maybe a lower cost, maybe you want to program on the fly. Uh, and uh, I thought, hey, is that even possible? I've seen Scott make his glider software, which is trying to reduce some of the tethers. But how do you how do you do it where it's totally not need a computer and you not need a uh, uh, laptop or anything else to go with it? So uh, so instead of making a cyber deck computer like uh, some of those Raspberry Pis are, uh, decided to make a cyber duck computer. Okay, <laughs> so made it a little smaller and a little tongue in cheek. Okay, uh, my wife designed this up in Tinkercad. And we sliced it so it could open up and you could use it as a computer. This is a sample. Uh, I don't know if you can show my my other other screen or I need to change that. Um, uh, let's, let's see. Can you see it on my okay, hang on, maybe I have to do it. If you have it, uh, yeah, if you're just switching between, you'll you'll do the switch. Okay, can you get, you can see that? Okay, there we are. Okay. So uh, so one thing we need to do is we gotta have some keyboard input. So right here is my keyboard. Uh, it's got a USB on the go input here, okay, and this uh, pink cable here is, is my power, okay, uh, and inside I've got a display, okay, right in here, sorry if you can't see very well, okay, there's a display, uh, and inside uh, to you to get the keyboard input, we actually have to have a separate board for that, uh, which is running as a USB host, okay, that's this itsy bitsy M4 right here near my thumb, okay, and then the main computer here, or main processor, which is running the display and actually running CircuitPython is this one right here, uh, and I've got like kind of prototyping area, so you could hook up some other things to it if you want to while you're programming it. Okay. So one thing was getting input through the keyboard, which uh, actually I didn't have a USB keyboard, so my neighbor was kind enough to give me one of these. So thanks to him for uh, passing that along. Okay. Uh, but this is a, this USB host is actually taking the input and then sending it through UART to the main computer, the main processor right here, which is doing all the the main processing. Okay. Um, but one thing that uh, was a challenge was one, there's no real REPL that or the REPL that's running on CircuitPython takes um, only inputs through the USB terminal, okay? So I had to write this REPL, which actually takes input from UART. So it's kind of a wrapper around the REPL, okay, which is running there. I don't know if you can see that or not. But uh, uh, in addition to the REPL where you can run commands, we also need an editor. So that was another challenge. So um, there's a gentleman by the name of Robert H. H. on GitHub who had a MicroPython editor, and I've adapted it here to run with UART input. I'm just moving around on the keyboard. I'm not sure if you can read that, but you can at least see my cursor going up and down. And this is uh, the first program that I wrote, actually typed it on this uh, CyberDuck computer. Uh, and you can save files and, uh, and execute them. So I'll show you the first, first program that I wrote here. It was basically a demo program to write a little sprite on the screen and uh, show show what it was made out of. So uh, so basically combined several things. One was the uh, USB input running a USB host. Uh, second was the REPL, which I call it a REPL interceptor. It basically intercepts uh, text on the, the um, UART and uh, runs those commands just like the REPL does. Um, and then the um, uh, text editor. Again, thanks to the, the patience of Robert HH. He's, he's uh, uh, help, helped me a lot on uh, understanding Python and actually GitHub, which I'm totally new at and total disaster with uh, commits and all, but uh, he's thankful he's been patient with me on that. So, uh, but it just showed, it's unreal. <laughs> yeah, what you can do with a couple of these uh, itsy bitsies um, and uh, really make a portable computer out of it. That is really fantastic. I see, uh, I, I can see in the um, backstage here, a lot of smiles from a bunch of uh, people, mm -hmm. including Scott here, who are just sort of, <laughs> there's people applauding. In fact, uh, if it's cool, I want to bring Scott on and see if Scott has any questions for you, because this is right up his alley. Hold oh, on. Okay. Yeah, I was actually just going to catch you on Discord and be like, that looks really cool. And okay, thanks. 
Uh, looks like Jeff hadn't seen this either, and he's pretty excited. So it's possible we can get some of the the REPL UART stuff in. I think it's about time that we have a better way to do the the serial in besides USB. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's just what you guys have built. I mean, it's, it's, it's building blocks that you can wrap a lot of stuff around it. Even for somebody mm -hmm. like me who had hardly any, any knowledge about this, and within a couple of weeks, you can really make something totally new out of it. So I think next steps are basically don't have a USB keyboard, which I don't know if anybody has those anymore, <laughs> uh, but use your phone, right, to uh, Bluetooth. Uh, uh, to input, so it's even easier to get somebody going. You know, you could you could imagine giving a kid this and him running some LEDs mm -hmm. and things on it, or who, who knows what he might some sensor inputs, right? And they should type it right on the thing, so he doesn't need anything else. So anyway, yeah. love what you guys I'm, have built just opens the doors to many so many different things. So great, yeah, I, I'd love to do HDMI output as well, so you can basically do like Commodore sixty four style, like plug yeah. it into a TV and um, a keyboard. A man after my own heart here, my first computer. <laughs> I love that you co-developed this with a really great enclosure too. The fact. Oh that yeah. Well, cool. again, tongue in cheek with a cyber deck, yeah. right? I had to uh, make a little little uh, really uh, comment on that. So, and it's waterproof and ready ready to go on the fly. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you you sharing that, and we hope to see uh, more of of your progress on that. And like Scott said, maybe. Uh, Get a chance to uh, fold some of these ideas oh, yeah. into, into what yeah. we're doing. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for including it on the um, uh, weekly, and particularly in, in the the Discord chat. Uh, I got to thank uh, Foamy guy, who's really helpful. Pointing, you know, there are a few hurdles, right? There's just a few nuggets of, hey, go look at this web page or whatever. Helped yeah. a lot, like USB storage, local uh, USB storage versus local storage, and things like that. So he was really helpful and and encouraging. So I appreciate his his input on all this. So. Tremendous. Thank you again so much. Uh, yeah, we'll see you, see you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, you know what? While you're here, Scott, do you mind? Uh, you have something to tell? <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to do that. Um, first, and more, first and foremost, uh, Teensy 4.1 was released. It's not focused, but um, it's longer than the original Teensy 4.0. So this is a comparison for those of you who don't see. It's a lot of the same pins, but just longer and it has a SD card slot. Um, I got uh, a pre-production board from Paul and I added it this week. So uh, on the latest version of CircuitPython, the unstable one, which came out this week, which is 5.4 beta zero, I, there's Teensy 4.1 support uh, for that. So try it out. It's also got low power work in there. So try that out as well. And then uh, if you can show my screen, John, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, we've had this capability of making stubs. And stubs are a kind of a side Python file that gives more information about uh, an API than the original file has. And that's really handy for CircuitPython where like digital IO is implemented in C. It's not actually implemented in Python. So um, we... Uh, Dylan's been working on moving all of our native docs to stubs so that um, editors can do a better job at completing. Mm. Um, so I, the goal, and so if you work on an editor that edits Python, uh, reach out to me, please. Uh, the goal is that you could do like import digital IO and then do digital IO dot and it would auto complete like That's great. Uh, digital in out, for example. And then like once you pick that, then it fills out like how many parameters there are Mm -hmm. and what they're named and all that stuff. So, so I never realized this is why we see that sometimes, but not always is because some things are implemented as a Python library and some are in C. Right, right. So the editors are pretty smart about like, oh, if you have like some library that's all Python code, it can look at that Python code and be uh, and and use it to hint you further. Um, but because CircuitPython has this core that's written in C, uh, we haven't really had a good option for that. Um, so the way, the way that it works, and I just wanted to show this real quick, is that you can, in the top level of CircuitPython, you can do um, make stubs. And this goes through all of the shared bindings and packages it up. Um, so you'd also be able to do just like pip install CircuitPython stubs. And then I just wanted to do a quick show of what, what that actually means, um, is that there's this like top level uh, bus IO description. And then um, for each class, we have like comments. And now we also have like uh, parameter information, including like the type here. So 
um, it would your editor will be able to verify like, oh, you put the wrong type of object where or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, in our forever quest to make it easier for people to work on it. And this is kind of one of those tools underneath. Um, and Kmatch mentioned like Glider. Like this is one of the things that I really felt like we was a prerequisite for doing Glider well, where you're like kind of like, you know, somewhere between a text editor and make code where you you're in a particular spot and you want to figure out what all your options are for that one spot. Mm -hmm. um, and this information is really handy for that. That's really excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. If this will if this will help out with the CyberDuck uh, version of the editor as well, that's great. Um, yeah. So yeah, currently, when we, when we see things like the um, syntax highlighting in something like Moo or um, Atom, uh, how much of that is would be coming from something like a stub file, or is it all defined in in another uh, sort of library or text? So file? the the syntax highlighting itself is like kind of more fundamental to the language where it's like, oh, I know this spot is always going to be a variable, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't actually know anything about that variable. Whereas um, Python has this, has introduced in the last few versions, this idea of optional typing, uh, which is something that's more common in other languages and, and required in other languages. But type uh, Python has an optional, which is really nice for beginners. So you can ignore it until you need it. Um, or for us, for example, like our, we assume our library writers are more experienced in Python and therefore they can put type information, which then like means that when somebody else is using the library, they can get better, um, help from their editor to validate that like, mm -hmm. oh, you're, you're misusing this, for example. I see. Um, um that's excellent. So, what's the? Have you started to implement this in in any cases? Is it, is it in testing at all, or is this sort of the beginning stages of this? So, uh, Dylan did the hard work of converting all of our docs over. Um, we'll get it packaged in pip, and I was I was actually hoping to show it in an editor, um, but there's some weirdness with it right now. So, I'm actually was talking with the VS Code folks today. Uh, I need to ask Nicholas about Mu. Uh, I think that would be a good target. Um, and then, I uh, I did get it briefly in sublime, but then it wasn't working again. So, um, yeah, it's kind of early and, uh, but this is like a, a prerequisite. So, like I said, if you work on editors or you have an editor like PyCharm yeah. that you like, and you want to kind of like figure it out, um, please reach out. Cause, um, I'd love to see this all used in, in those spots. Terrific. Good. Thanks for uh, continuing to strive to make it easier for people who want to just use the use the language like yeah that. it can always be made easier Terrific. there's always things to to fix good all right thank you scott i appreciate it and uh no we problem. will talk to you soon mm -hmm. and, uh let's see who have we got next we got paint your dragon hello paint your dragon hey there you know scott's shirt is a really neat demonstration of aliasing it has the binary numbers on it and scott move back and forth the um, <laughs> here and there it's doing it, but it was. Yeah, a, I, I see what you're saying. Where the zeros remain visible, but the ones sometimes fall between columns. They're between the pixels, yeah. Sparkle on and off, which is relevant to nothing. I just I know <laughs> weird. Let me uh, let me switch cameras. Go to the overhead camera. Um, is it not? There it goes. Okay. Um, so I keep bringing this same. Uh, fragile pile of wires by week after week. It's not actually the same fragile pile of wires every week. It changes very slightly. And so this week, um, the fragile pile of wires is connected to a uh, ESP32 uh, feather board. So we have this uh, newish library called Protomatter for driving the RGB LED matrices. And one by one, we are porting it to new boards. So we have SAMD in there. Uh, we have uh, NRF52, we have STM32, and now we have ESP32 support in there. And code kind of hatches in the Arduino protomatter library, but from there it carries over into CircuitPython. Um, so we'll have both, both environments supported on all these different boards. So just came by to say, hey, here it is working on uh, ESP32. Also, I just uh, published a guide that explains how to port it to new devices. 
So that's that's what's going on. Excellent. Good. Thanks for bringing that by. Um, I have to admit, I don't know or understand what the proto matter side of things is in this. Is there is there a remedial explanation I can find somewhere that you can? Okay. Well, proto matter is an uh, is the it's the name of the Arduino library that uh, drives the RGB LED matrices. Ah, okay, got and it. From there, it it gets shoehorned into Circuit Python, I but it, it starts on the Arduino side. And I arbitrarily called the library Proto Matter for stupid pun reasons. And unfortunately, the name had stuck by that point. So <laughs> this happens to you a lot. I hope you know. It does. I know. <laughs> I got I to gotta think more carefully about these in the future. Nah. But um, yeah, it was a line in Star Trek Three about oh, okay Genesis Matrix Matrix Proto Ma I, It was dumb. So we're stuck with it now. <laughs> okay, and so you said we've got this now on. Uh... This is the ESP32 that you're working on here, but you've also got this now on uh, what M4 and NRF52840. Uh, yeah, M0, M4, NRF52, STM32, and now ESP32. All the boards. Uh, almost. I'm working on one more now. Awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. Good. Well, thank you for bringing that by. Sure thing. And uh, we will see you soon. Let's see. Uh, who have we got to? Go to next. How about Liz, Split City DIY? Let's bring you on and see what you've got. Hello. Hey, how's it going? All right, thank you. What's new? Uh, so the Xylo Pi is coming along, and I'm just uh, bringing up my camera to share because the battery is running a little low. I think I can share it now, though. Um, so it was a little harrowing. Like right before this, uh, I was just finishing up soldering, um, kind of like kind of in a half complete state um and i have four notes going right now though so i'm triggering that just with my midi keyboard on my desk uh it's going over bluetooth midi um so it's coming along it's yeah uh so i got two muxes here uh itsy bitsy blue fruit and then Darlington drivers to the solenoids and uh, the Rulers brothers were kind enough to send me out some 3D printed mounts that they also designed um, because my printer is having a lot of problems. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't have been able to get to this point without their their help with that. Uh, Cause it's definitely like a kinetic project where to see how things are gonna be able to be spaced out. You kind of have to like play with it directly, but I'm oh, excited. <laughs> and are you, uh, so these are these uh, like the five volt yeah, the little mm -hmm. tiny ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way the code is, and because of how glockenspiels are, the faster you release from hitting the note, the better tone you'll have. So mm -hmm. with the code, it's actually when I when the note is triggered, the solenoid quickly like hits and goes right back up. So they mm -hmm. aren't like on like for very right. long. It's like right, 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 right. Just so that quick will quick. also exactly. So I'll help yeah. with the power stuff. That's okay. good. So yeah, actually, I've been working on a project that uses the solenoids to ding a chime, and oh. I was. I was finding that kind of just trying to tune that to be super short, like yeah, zero two seconds or something like that, seemed to be decent for for uh, triggering it, but still getting us. Yeah, yeah, great. And uh, are you? So you're going to get a solenoid per uh, node yes. eventually. Yeah. On here and and maintain just uh, four at a time based on how a real glockenspiel, or are you going to go um, for it? So I'm actually going to make it so that any of them could be triggered uh, at wow. any time. Wow. Uh, kind of like a player glockenspiel, basically. Neat. Yeah. Very so, cool. Good. I'd Thanks. For... By tomorrow with more of them working. Oh, good. Good. Excellent. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see the, the progress on this. This is a really cool project. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Liz. No problem. And now we've got our Colin Cunningham, who's got hopefully some show and telling to do. I better have something if I came here, huh? I think it's really, so. I'm, it's me, John. It's just me. <laughs> I, you know what? I take everything back. I've said you don't need to show and tell anything. It's just nice to see you. I said that I was fishing. <laughs> yeah, darn it. Um, so JP, uh, do you drive or have you ever driven an automobile motor I, car? Yes. I have. Yeah, I figured. Another safe bet. Uh, well, you know, on the dash, you have the tachometer the, with the RPMs. Uh, 
So yeah, so that's uh, measures your engine in revolutions per minute, the amount of times it's internal is revolving. Um, I was digging through my archives of stuff and uh, junk and cool test equipment, and I found something I want to show you guys. It is a resident read, resonant read tachometer. Super simple here. I'm gonna change cameras. And so you've got these little white indicators all in a row. And you mount this or hold it up against a uh, an engine's casing. And these little white indicators go up and down. And the one that moves the most indicates the amount of revolutions per minute that the motor is operating at. It's a really simple thing, actually. I'll show you when I open it up. It was um, from I think, 1904, invented by a German physicist, uh, Hermann Fram. And I even have a larger one. This one is, this one goes seven to 11,000 RPMs. And this big Jagundo version Woo. goes from 6,000 to 24,000 RPMs. So Colin, I think this is an outrage. You're trying to convince us that that thing measures the revolutions of a motor just through resonant frequencies? Sure it does, John. Wow. Anyway, see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I held it up against different things. I don't have any engine strong enough around here because I don't have one of said motor cars uh -huh. available to me right now. Uh, so I just kind of believe it. And I've wow. seen corroborating evidence on the internet. Um, so you would think you, I don't know, you get some kind of interesting innards on this. Mm -hmm. But when I open it up, that's it. <laughs> nothing to see you here. Got, <laughs> you've nothing to see here. Put it back on. Just, wow. just use it. Don't worry about it. It's just that your imagination makes it work. It's also it's, it's just off. a book of matches. But yeah, basically, it looks like it is. You can see. Uh, I won't get a close enough uh, detail, really, but these were tuned. You can see they're filed down to each uh, because oh. they, they don't have differing lengths. Yeah. So they have differing uh, weights, essentially. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to pull the focus. But there was like a nub yeah. uh, that's been filed down to tuned uh, so it resonates at the precise frequency they want for each one. That is so fantastic. Pretty cool. I, I'm going to have to find something that makes a move and report back. For sure. Yeah, we got to get you a, a, a motor, or maybe you can take a, a blender and break yeah. a couple of your teeth in it. So it's I'll, do, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go order an Uber and uh, have them, have them <laughs> idle it. there and hold it up there. Go, okay, you're done. All right, thanks. Hail a cab. Yeah. Yep, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I've watched, uh, I saw someone tuning a DIY kalimba one time and they just got approximate lengths and tack welded things down and then just started shaving with a with a file uh, until, until they tuned it. Wow. So it looks like that's how this thing was tuned. Yeah, yeah, essentially the same thing. That is really rad. Yeah, fun stuff. Anyway, I will I will find video as evidence. I will come back and prove prove that these are still functional. And uh, thank you to my uncle Bill who donated these to me as well. Thanks, Colin, and thanks, Uncle Bill. We appreciate it. That is a, a definitely a new one on me. I was so excited to learn about that today. Very cool. Cool. Stuff. All right. Well, we'll we'll see you next time. Hopefully with a motor. All right. I'll okay. work. Okay. Uh, and, oh, I cut Colin off kind of quick there. Sorry, Colin. Uh, now we've got Geek Mom Projects. Hello. And Hi, John. How are you? For patiently waiting. I'm well, thank you. Uh, it's been really entertaining. I'm still stuck on the duck, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> it's so all been good. Will you play us out? Will you show us our last project of the day? That's great. I'll be happy to do so. You can cut me off anytime. You just don't get to find out how it works, and I'll show mm. you the project. And then if you don't, like, we'll see how long I have to explain how it works. So... I've been working with PCBs, and of course, um, it's an LED wearable, so I've, it's idea for a pendant. And there are actually 10 individual small PCBs here, which um, most of them are the same, but there's a different one. Uh, there's a controller on one end and a, um, a power on the other. And I've been searching for a way to make LEDs bendable and sturdy. And you know, I love LED strips, but you've been them a number of times, and you know, things break. Um, and of course, circuit boards don't flex. So I've configured basically 10 circuit boards into five different segments that are joined together in such a way that if I turn it on, so it's, I don't know if you can see, there you go. You can see the, it's not programmed very excitingly, but I got it 
working last night. So you can bend it into kind of any configuration you want. Again, I thought I'd use it as a pendant um, and have it still, it still, you know, still works. The signal travels all the way down uh, to the end, no matter the relative um, configuration of the PCBs. That's PCB. beautiful. That's really cool. It also Thanks. kind of reminds me of like a caffeine molecule or something yeah. like that, like in some, sure. some configurations. Yeah, you could do lots of different shapes. I don't know how much time I have. If you want to know how it works, I'll yeah, we, be quick. Yeah, we'd love to know how it works. Um, okay. I, I'll, I'll mention that we normally go right around this time to start uh, Ask an Engineer, but Ask an Engineer is going to be a little late today. Uh, it's going to start at 9 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Uh, and if I if my calculations are right, it is currently 8 p.m. Eastern. So if someone, unless someone wants to correct me on that, I get time wrong sometimes. But I think we've got uh, a little time. I'll just take a second. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, um, these are five different segments of PCBs. Basically, um, each segment is composed of two layers. The the top layer. This is an unsoldered um, top layer. You can see where the um, 2020 LEDs fit. Um, and on the back, I learned how to make um, unusually shaped pads in Eagle. I've got these round contact, these round um, uh, pads, uh, concentric circles. Uh, the middle is voltage, the, uh, sorry, the central one is voltage, outer one is ground, the middle is signal. And the bottom layer, which passes a signal to the next board, has these, um, if you can see these little um, pressure contacts. And I've got, I didn't, bring one, um, but I've got a uh, laser cut layer in the middle so to stop it from squishing the contact pads down too much. So each segment goes on top of the previous one and you connect the two with a, uh, I've got a, a plastic rivet in there and so they can rotate relative to each other. And so each kind of segment of the chain is one top layer connected to a bottom layer like this. And then you can connect them to the next link in the chain with little rivets that connect the contact to the LED, the top layer LED PCB. Hopefully that's brilliant, was clear. brilliantly Thanks. done. Anyway, so thanks. Cool. I've got some other ideas I want to do with kind of the same concept, but this yeah. was this was the first um, prototype that actually worked. This has yeah. <laughs> been a while oh, in the making. Can I ask? Are the um, contacts are those like a surface mount part? Yeah, that yeah. you're using the spring contacts. Yeah, they're surface mount um, spring contacts. Uh, they're mm -hmm. little tiny. I don't know if you can see it, like little teeny yeah. tiny. So there's nothing on the bottom. Nothing to you know. No, no through hole on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And and mm -hmm. other than their connection uh, mechanical um, stop, these could go three sixty based on. Well, uh, the, yeah, they can. They'll collide yeah. with each other, but otherwise, right. sure, they could. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. like I kept making. I the ones on the end because I needed. I I don't want it to be too chunky, but yeah, the ones on the end have little the where I put the um where I put the power. You know, mm -hmm. I, so it it doesn't go like the side the knots on the side stop it from going more than more than that but yeah i'd like to my goal actually my next um exercise with this concept is i'd like to actually make uh, functional gears out of circuit boards that can Ooh. like contact and communicate with each other even though they're separate and rotate relative Ooh. to each other so wow we'll see. fantastic good oh i love it anyway, so much thanks. thank you for bringing that on that was way cool thank, thank you, you for playing. that was such an awesome project you always bring cool stuff and uh thanks. hopefully we'll see you again soon thanks all right uh gosh i think that may be it. Uh, I think that's all of our projects for the week. And uh, I wanna thank you so much for stopping by for our show and tell. And I wanna thank everyone who brought things on to show and to talk about. It was some really great stuff, exciting things. Uh, as I mentioned, the Ask an Engineer will be uh, most likely, not 100% sure, but most likely uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern this evening uh, as our Mr. Lady Ada and Lady Ada are uh, off fighting crime down at City Hall or something like that. Uh, and uh, they will post uh, to the blog and the Discord uh, when they are ready to go, or just watch your, your uh, if you're a subscriber to the YouTube channel or Twitch or one of those, you'll see uh, when that show is going live. So uh, yes, thank you again so much. Lots of cool projects this week. Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, who's been helping. And I think we've got Noah and Pedro have been taking some notes on this so we can slip those to Lady Ada if she wants to talk about the projects. Otherwise, this will be archived and you can come back and watch it later. Uh, thank you all so much and we will see you next time. That's it for Show and Tell. Bye-bye. <laughs>